So tonight it's my great pleasure to uh, to welcome Mimi Huang and Eric Bungay to the department to tell us about their work and their practice in architects. Thank you. In architects and architects. Um, it's also a great pleasure to welcome Mimi back um, because she's a uh, an undergraduate alum of MIT, and I'll, although she's probably been here many times in between, it's always great to have um, an alumni back to talk to us. Uh, N Architects is a Brooklyn-based practice uh, founded in 1999 with the goal of addressing contemporary issues in architecture through conceptually driven, socially engaging, and technologically innovative work. And I think we'll see some of that this evening. Their work investigates interactions between buildings, public space, and their dynamically changing contexts. In recent projects such as Carmel Place, which I'm sure some of you have seen, which is an amazing micro unit building, at the Design Center A slash D slash O, uh, the N NYS uh, Equal he Rights Heritage Center, and the renovation of Chicago Nav Navy Pier, and Architects is addressing critical issues facing our cities in terms of how we live, how we work, and activate public spaces in response to changing demographics, housing shortage, evolving workplace technologies, and the need for equality in the public realm. In fact, you know, many issues that uh, we as a department have discussed and are central to our, our, uh, you know, our interests. Um, in terms of awards, uh, in architects, the awards are, and honors are impressive and include a 2017 National AIA Honor Award um, in Architecture, a 2017 NYS AIA Firm of the Year, 2016 Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Architecture, uh, and the uh, AIA New York uh, Andrew uh, Thomas Award for Pioneers in Housing, and the 2006 Architectural League's Emerging Voices. Quite a quite a amazing list there. The firm has also been ranked in the top 10 in the US in, t in the design cat category for the past five years by Architect Magazine. And uh, just last, it was one of the, just one of the many honors in 2012, World, World Architecture News named an architect part of a select group crowned to lead the next generation of designers in the 20th century. So we look forward to hearing all, all about that. Um, <laughs> Eric. Eric is a co-founding partner of the practice and an adjunct associate professor at Columbia. Eric also received a Master of Architecture from the GSD and a B. Art from McGill. Uh, he's previously taught at Parsons School of Design uh, and RISD and has been a visiting professor at Harvard, Yale, UC Berkeley, and uh, Toronto. Mimi is the other co-founding partner and also an adjunct uh, associate professor at Columbia, and I hear he's kind of switched off in terms of his teaching commitments. Um, Eric, uh, sorry, Mimi received her BSc here for at MIT. Um, I'll say which year, it was 1993, and uh, a Master of Architecture from the GSD, and she's also previously taught at Yale and is a visiting professor at Harvard and UC Berkeley. So. Um, as many of you know, or as you may, actually you may not know, that we sort of named our, our lecture series this semester Building Consensus. And the whole idea of that was, you know, to try and see what the issues are that are driving um, different architects, different designers in their work. And really, instead of you know, really trying to see whether there's things that we share, what do we share, what, what are the concerns, what are the kind of parameters and issues that, that Bind our, bind our work together um, in the sense that there are issues that deepen and drive um, different designers' um, work in practice. Um, so tonight's talk is actually called Buildings and Almost Buildings, <laughs> which seems to kind of fit within that general <laughs> rubric of the idea of consensus. And I should say that it's also the title of their book, which is um, at the back of the room, and you can buy a copy of that later. <laughs> um, it, and just to summarize what I, th what I think we're going to be told about buildings and almost buildings, uh, just some questions. Is architecture inherently complete, or is it a state of incompletion and seemingly inadequacy that incites us to imagine architecture as an armature of an ever-changing daily life? 
across a range of buildings, public spaces, and ephemeral installations, N architects argues for the formal and social potential of an architecture that remains somehow incomplete and amb am ambiguously perceived, or in the architect's words, words almost buildings. So, um, sounds fascinating. Look forward to hearing a lot more. Look forward to hearing a lot more about that. Thank you for coming, and welcome to MIT. when I was here as an undergrad after I barely passed out of all of the um, undergraduate first year required courses that were found in course four. Um, I thought I was going to be okay. Um, and we're always happy to come back to Cambridge where we met and fell in love. <laughs> buildings and almost buildings are about questions uh, that we've been asking for a long time about the objective aspects of architecture and its subjective experience. After we finished Canopy, And the NIST users who we started to term these people who decided to TP our canopy or this guy who sent us this unsolicited um, installation of his own. Um, the users and NIST users who had appropriated our installation as their own. At the end of the summer, we sold the bamboo to the artist Matthew Barney who used it as scaffolding in his upcoming movie. At the time, we were just trying to recoup our debt from building Canopy, but in hindsight, we love the fact that it transformed from one kind of armature to another. So is architecture necessarily complete, or is it a state of indeterminacy that incites us to engage with it? We found, um, after 20 years of practice, that whereas we tried to make our early installations as building-like as possible, because we were getting building installa um, installations, we are now trying to embody the attributes of the almost building in our more permanent work and asking the question, can they remain incomplete and embrace ambiguity in positive ways? At what point is architecture complete? It's a question that is tied to philosophical and scientific notions of space, and we recognize that there is very much a current zeitgeist in the open-ended in architecture. We are trying to ask this question through three different frameworks. The incomplete armature, boundaries, and zone. So at its most reduced, architecture is represented as an armature. Logier's primitive hut probably completes with the cave or the nest as the origin of this. 150 years later, Le Corbusier's domino house introduces an x-ray of architecture's constructive potential. We think of both of these as almost buildings imagining them as a midway point between something else and a building. They're missing something, which means that they are becoming something else. Armatures that are capable of endless reconfiguration, awaiting the enactment of their potential. What inspires us is that in both their social and formal aspects, they remain uncertain, informal, and open to multiple interpretations. In the 1960s, the armature was promoted to megastructure, allowing for an easy expansion from building to city. We are interested in that interpretation, but also at the more finite scale of building, where fields and volumes meet. And so for this competition on Detroit's waterfront, uh, for which we teamed up with James Turner Field Operations, we're operating at both scales that of megastructure and building, and proposed along Detroit's waterfront a 21-foot-long armature, 2,100-foot-long armature. This is why I nearly didn't pass first year. <laughs> I'm really not that good at math. Um, we uh, 
Um, Detroit, like many waterfront cities, is reimagining their waterfront. And so the, the, what we called the porch for us was a way to um, negotiate between city edge and water edge um, in their, the city's bid to reclaim formerly industrial areas as public realm. Um, we spent a long time <laughs> searching for variation, um, initially thinking about formal variation along its length, trying to break down that scale. Ultimately, we decided that the tension between the finite form of the armature and the variation of structures below was more interesting. And so the porch is an armature that allows for an infinite variety of functions um, in the, the uh, buildings below, but is also seen as a kind of armature for amenities, um, for vertical green walls, for uh, athletic uh, um, play equipment, as infrastructure for utilities, Wi-Fi, etc. It's an armature, this is on the left of this image, of blue limb timber and steel. And we imagined it both as a threshold um, between city edge and water's edge, and as a catalyst for activity in this very unused area of the city. And so it appears infinite in some places, endless in others, and very much a work in progress, open to appropriation. This is something that we try to also um, convince the city of, that you don't have to build it all at once, but we didn't believe that it would become, possibly because it was too large. So here's another armature, smaller. This is for Hoboken, New Jersey. Um, this is the largest community park that we will be built in Hoboken. Um, you may be familiar with um, the issues of Hoboken. It's very close to, to uh, sea level, and so the one inch of rain in Hoboken actually um, produces a lot of flooding and a lot of outfall um, because the rain is combined with sewer. And so um, our park, um, the, the building sits on a park that is actually designed to retain a million gallons of rainwater and is very much conceived as an armature um, for the public um, park for uh, indoor and outdoor amenities. It's a very simple ellipse under which two, bu two volumes sit. One is a community room, the other is the annex to a library. Through these volumes, we're creating this kind of layered sense of space from indoors to outdoors to indoors to outdoors again, um, holding the experience of the park within. In this worm's eye, we're showing um, that kind of spatial layer and also the idea that the building itself is an armature for um, fake trees. <laughs> These are climbing plants that um, kind of merge the greenery of the park uh, around into, into the building itself. Um, swings hang, hang from it, other things hang from it, um, and it really is about this kind of living in between indoors and outdoors. Very soon after we lost Detroit, we actually received um, a real commission to build another long armature. In this case, um, this one is uh, under construction um, and will be complete at the end of the year. This is Jones Beach. It's actually a barrier island in Long Island Sound. Um, one of the good aspects of Robert Moses' legacy, um, this is um, one of um, a very, very, uh, or part of an extremely well-loved public beach. Um, we are on the more, uh, the less populated end, and we are demolishing this low-slung building, which is an SLM bathhouse. And so you can understand this building in a way um, in terms of responding to a lot of constraints. It's right up against the flood zone. Um, but it's also utilizing the piles that were already there. And so that is the footprint of the building and we simply extended it much longer. Um, we chopped about two thirds of that parking lot which had the dubious fame of being one of the largest parking lots in the world. We chopped the two thirds out to create the rubble for the landscaping around. 
Um, the program is an energy and nature center, um, and so um, the building is conceived as an educational tool to um, educate about the correlation between energy and nature. Um, it actually came um, about in, um, because of funding, two different funding sources. One is New York State Park, and the other is the local power authority. And so um, what started as two fiefdoms, everybody in their own wing of the building has um, gradually um, merged into this uh, interesting hybrid um, of galleries, um, functions in between classrooms and um, other closed functions. And so this is the approach from the north side through this kind of green scape um, made out of that chopped up rubble. And then the south side um, opens onto the beach and the water. And it's a very, very long porch. Um, it's um, also a, a CLT timber construction. Um, there is a trellis on both sides, um, which really animates and extends the education function outdoors with as little drywall as possible, which is another one of our goals. Um, and, and so in this cross-section, you see that um, long, continuous gallery is, is this kind of exhibition space that snakes in between the classroom volumes, and you really see the function of this building in between indoor, outdoor, um, education function in, inside, extending to the outside with outdoor exhibitions and outdoor classrooms. This building is um, the um, poster child, what, what, what is the name? Uh, the, uh, Governor Cuomo's um, climate the poster action. poster <laughs> child for Governor Cuomo's climate initiative, which is New York State's commitment to the New Green Deal. Um, so it is um, net zero. And this is what it looks like now. I'm super excited. I'm back in the fall. So as we've been um, thinking about the armature in architecture, the scale of the, its level of disappearance or appearance, we've also thinking, been thinking about possibilities of the boundaries and zones in architecture. Can the boundary be complete and incomplete in different ways, in different spaces, at different times? Um, like many of you probably like making holes, creating gaps, um, and uh, from the shallow and the, to the deep in an effort to really kind of confound the limits of, 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 of buildings and their context. Sometimes in our work, as we'll show you in a couple of projects, we can act as sneakily transferring um, space from the public realm, the, from the private realm or from the public realm. Um, but often it's, it's more a kind of a question of uh, challenging the idea of a facade or a boundary as a single thickness and really trying to understand this as multiple incomplete layers that bring into question where building begins or ends. And at what thickness um, is a boundary a zone if a boundary is elevated to the status of space? And if we progressively erase this zone, at what point does this building begin to be just incomplete? Now clearly this would vary depending on your culture, uh, the climate in which you live. Um, but within this framework, we're really inspired by Le Corbusier's Villa Baiseau from 1928. And on the, on the left is a plan of the project as built, but not the one that Le Corbusier wanted. Um, this is the one that the client wanted because she understood the, cli uh, the climate. And it's very interesting how each floor has a different uh, configuration stack with resulting um, veranda spaces around uh, the perimeter. But by contrast, the castles that uh, were uh, inspired Louis Kahn, like with Kamlong and Castle in Scotland, um, really kind of describe a different kind of notion of incomplete zones in this space, geometrically defined, you know, hewn out of, out of rock. So if we move from the perimeter to the center in, in a building and think about the verandas, light wells, uh, courtyards, or if we move in section from the elevated ground plane of the modernist to the fantasy of the traditionalist ground plane to a loggia and then the covered roof, we can imagine a series of incomplete zones uh, throughout uh, uh, the building. And we're really interested in how these can in inform a building spatial structure, um, which for us is a kind of a term that you know, um, sidesteps the issues of type. So when car brand Mini, which is, uh, belongs to BMW, approached us to transform this 22,000 square foot um, space in, in, in Greenpoint in Brooklyn. We were really relieved that there are no cars involved. That would have been kind of terrible. But as the name changed 
so did the, uh, the mission of the project. They called it grassroots box because they didn't want to land a spaceship um, in, in Greenpoint. In fact, they wanted to generate a series of conversations about design and shift or pivot sort of corporate uh, strategy from selling cars to thinking about them as a design company to, to make cars. But it changed to the name Free Space, which is a, a term we came up with. And then it changed to ADO, or A forward slash B, forward slash O, as you said, um, which means Amalgamated Drawing Office, which is where the first mini car um, was built. So Greenpoint is an interesting area in Brooklyn. It's still full of manufacturing, custom, um, commercial areas. And uh, the building that we inherited, and by the way, we love ugly buildings. It's just like every, whenever you see an ugly building, you want to change it, um, was a bra factory. Um, and so we thought, well, our first instinct is let's cut a hole. Um, and then we did that. We moved the corner of the building, gave it over to New York City, the smallest uh, unmapped park, um, and then um, began to think about how do we, you know, wh once we cut a hole, how do we build it back? So we were really interested in this idea of making a very ambiguous um, transformation rather than irreparable change. So we asked the contractors to carefully chip off the mortar from the bricks and then reassemble them. And proud of our invention, we called it reconstituted graffiti, and it came out much better than we expected. And then the graffiti artist came back and tagged it again. And so I think if you're interested in um, you know, appropriation, you can't be mad at this sort of issue. Um, but it's interesting to see how these layers basically have evolved. And this was our basic uh, approach to the whole building, this idea of remixing. So we cut many holes, all in square proportion, like all the garages throughout in the context. Um, but also this, this kind of ethos of uh, remixing permeated the physical details and the programmatic uh, combinations that would happen within. So we would leave an electrical fence patched and things like that and really express the sort of temporal aspect rather than show this as a new building. So the project contains um, basically the building uh, department's nightmare of how to make cocktail or program because we tried not to have walls. So on your left, you see there's a restaurant which we designed, and then in the middle, this free space, really kind of a river of space that um, is very public. People can go there, set up the Wi-Fi, and basically use it as their office, and it became kind of a community office where no one had to pay. On the right side is an incubator where Mimi uh, hands out $100,000 per uh, cohort per uh, group of a cohort of 10 every six months. So if you have an interesting idea that can improve urban life, either digital or physical, um, th they might fund it. There's also a member sort of space with a workshop, design shop, and at the top of the model, you'll see a space where we remove the roof, which we'll tell you a little bit more about. So these sp spaces basically intermingle and are separated not by so much walls, in some cases curtains, but these fluid connections across all of this. We basically had to file it as a restaurant to get around some of these uh, required separations. At the center of the project, we built uh, what we call a periscope, which emerged out of kind of uh, an impossibility of actually creating a second floor. So Mini is based in um, Munich, and the uh, German uh, folks thought, it should really look at Manhattan. We should have a deck looking at Manhattan. Well, we can't. Uh, zoning, accessibility costs. So we'll bring Manhattan to you, we said. So we created a periscope with two mirrors, one pointing at Manhattan, one down Y Street in Brooklyn. So there's a kind of a special spot where you stand and we've joined or remixed, as we like to say, the skylines of Manhattan and Brooklyn into one. And of course the sponsored thoughts are, well, how do you use the roof? So an artist came in and painted this ugly thing. But it's really nice sometimes when it snows and it goes away. And um, you know, clients are always asking us for Instagrammable moments. We didn't think about that, but that's kind of what's happened. It's become a very kind of interesting focus. In this part of the project, we removed the roof, put in a galvanized steel frame, just to see what would happen, trying to convince the client that we don't need to program everything. So London space uh, assemble, built uh, factory as it might be, and United Visual Artists created this installation, et cetera, et cetera. It's become a kind of uh, interesting uh, locus for the cultural programming. So while zoning has created silos of use, separating manufacturing from other uses, um, now these waterfront neighborhoods are kind of opening up new modes of production, making uh, work cultures more visible at different stories. So another project just uh, about a year later also underwent a few name changes which um, kind of exposed the changing and increasing ambitions. Before uh, this project became the New York State Equal Rights Heritage Center, it was just the humble um, uh, our, uh, visitor center, and that's the RSP re we responded to. So Auburn is in uh, the Finger Lakes district of New York State, a very beautiful area, which uh, throughout the late 19th century and early 20th century was crossroads of many progressive I ideals. Um, the site, it was a former municipal parking lot in front of uh, City Hall, but also next to William Seward's house, uh, which is now a museum. Um, has anyone heard of William Seward? 
So it's Tura's colleague, Tura's um, responsible for purchasing Alaska. Tura is the uh, Secretary of State to Abraham Lincoln and was the governor of New York. But most famously, Tura is uh, instrumental in the abolition of slavery. Um, and so this is where uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, the famous underground operator, lived the last 50 years of her life. And you'll see a statue of her right here in the bottom left in the plaza we designed. So th in this project, we basically um, had two historical contexts. One was the physical context, which is uh, very challenging to build it in, very historical, which the, the uh, people in the town were very protective of. And the other one was the context of progressive idea, um, which for which they were uh, much more uh, uh, receptive. So as a one-story volume next to these larger buildings, we really struggled with how to make a 7,500 square foot building uh, compete. So this table, we call it our lamp C. Um, shows you our uh, very fast uh, sort of attempt to create uh, a building that opened up to the landscape and connected to the various scales. And we realized that the best uh, kind of connection to the context is to really look at the houses along um, an adjacent street, the federal style houses. So on the bottom right, you'll see the footprint of our project, which is comprised of four volumes that open up and bring the landscape in, basically um, creating a kind of an incomplete zone. And th th the main reason for this was to basically make the exhibition, which is about equal rights, women's uh, liberation, abolition of slavery, LGBTQ rights, amongst others, um, basically to make this connect to the context. We even, in fact, saw that the context itself was content with the William Stewart House Museum just next door. So we really were able to convince the client that and the city that you know this building should be open, democratic, and really embracing uh, this context. So in this drone photo, you'll see how the volumes open up establish different orientations, and then bring the outside in, in this incomplete zone. This is a screen caption Rhino. It was kind of the winning image, uh, more than any sort of rendering, because the client understood when we started zooming around the Rhino model, what we were trying to do. And so here you see, uh, just a few months later, the same view. The project was subject to a very fast schedule, 19 months from getting the commission to the ribbon cutting. So we had six months to design the project and get it out to bid and nine months to build it with the bidding. So we decided uh, for two reasons, to make it a very sort of tough building, um, concrete, because the finish, the structure is the finish, but also because we wanted it to be very primitive, uh, very simple. Uh, we, we hate uh, layered ceilings, drop ceilings, things like that, and wanted to be very kind of primitive. So it's just concrete on the inside, brick on the outside, um, perhaps a floor like this with radiant heating, and all the mechanical and everything was to conceal as well as backup spaces in these cores, placing the visitor always on the perimeter, looking out at the context. The exhibition, which we co-designed, was organized by medium and not by theme, because many of these themes cross over, not always in positive ways. So abolition of slavery, women's suffrage have both positive and negative connections. So we start with a simple map, and we made it a chalkboard so they could uh, really update things that happen. And then you can turn left or right. We've learned that making sort of endless loop makes buildings feel uh, bigger, so there are no dead ends. There's a permanent exhibition called Seeing Equal Rights. The furniture is based on the, the history of Finger Lakes, so we tried to create a local connection to some of these more uh, regional or global uh, issues. Then you can encounter maps, portraits, speeches, that um, circular bench is a speech island. You can sit there, the button, and hear speeches connected to the equal rights or excerpts thereof, but spoken in contemporary voices, children, the great grandniece of Harry Tubman, people like that. Then there's a social justice table, which we designed as well, wh which has a circular video screen in the middle, which brings people around images of legislative milestones, as well as allowing them to search all the content uh, with iPads. Finally, there are political posters, uh, images of labor uh, movements and things like that. So Andrew Cuomo is responsible basically to the federal commission right now, and this is why the project uh, started as a humble visitor center and became an equal rights day day center in a matter of months. So on opening day, which is November 18th, 2018, a light snow had just fallen. Uh, it wasn't quite complete, but not in the way we talk about incomplete. It actually wasn't finished. <laughs> <laughs> the best moment was um, when the great grandniece, um, Sarah uh, Cope Johnson, of um, Harry Tubman, who's right here in the photograph, um, came to the project and, uh, and I asked her, so um, how do you like the building? And she said, better than expected. And so that was kind of a, <laughs> not what I expected to hear.
but we were happy. And it's become the living room of the town after a lot of controversy about losing the um, parking lot. So the next two projects I'm going to show were not built, but they're both, and they're both in China, and they're miles apart in terms of scale, but there's a connection between them, which, which I'll reveal. So some of you may have um, seen this. I think Mariana might recognize this um, very well. Um, this is the Ordos uh, 100 experiment. We are all uh, selected by Ai Weiwei. It's one of 100 architects. Uh, each of us designing a um, kind of a zoo of architecture, e uh, 1,000 square foot or 100 square meter house. So the site is in Inner Mongolia, which is very northern China, near Mongolia itself, uh, one of the energy sectors of China uh, with coal, uranium, uranium, and so on. And it was a very uh, speculative development just before uh, China's uh, bu housing bubble collapsed. And we were victims of, of that. Um, we thought of two, two intuitions that shaped our response. One, the extreme weather, uh, which really uh, goes from very cold and inhospitable to hot and dry and inhospitable. Um, <laughs> And also the fact that the house itself is uh, just too large. So instead of a 1,000 square foot house, we thought, well, let's make a smaller house, an inner house, within a larger outer house. Let's reduce the area that is insulated, a little bit more refined finishes, and create an outer house which is rougher, but also uh, uh, creates a different set of experiences so that people living in the house would live across the boundaries, across these thermal boundaries. And about a year after the uh, project collapsed, we um, created a thermal model with Arup to uh, establish exactly how uh, warm uh, air would leak willfully through single pane glass to the outer house. And therefore, using these dots, we calibrated exactly how, on a minus 20 degrees Celsius day, we would get a sort of temperate climate within the or, or condition within the outer house. And this was a 1 to 10 scale model we built for the Seoul Design Olympiad in 2009. The house is comprised of three volumes stacked, um, each one corresponding to orientation and, uh, and use. So these are stacks that all align parametrically uh, on four columns in the middle to make it very kind of inexpensive. So you have a you know, guest bedroom and garage and den, a living floor in the round, and uh, four bedrooms. And each of these, by virtue of these stacks, reduce these kind of uh, terraces um, in the outer house. So now we made these two renderings for the book, kind of tongue in cheek, trying to make them look unfinished or almost finished. We were trying to trick people. Maybe it was not built. Of course, we couldn't uh, quite make them that realistic. But we, we hesitate to show them in, in, a, in a complete uh, state as the project never happened. Um, eight years later, we were shortlisted uh, to design a, a library in Shanghai, um, a 1.2 million square foot uh, library. How do we create solitary and intimate spaces within this institutional scale? Well, we thought of um, our house in Ordos. And using some of the same techniques of creating a, a smaller space, uh, a really tight, compact drum with a convention center tucked under the landscape, we brought in Century Park, which is like the Central Park, into the site and up into the building. We were very interested in Shen Yuge, China's, China's oldest living library, and its sort of binary um, condition with a compact floor for book storage and a, a reading room. So we replicated this binary code in order to make a 10-story building feel like a five-story building. In other words, intimate, understandable, and, and something like a home. In fact, we call it library as home. So through, through, through the superimposition of these compact sandwich floors, we hope to create a, conti a vertically continuous library that connects um, patio, living room, um, study, and so on, and really make this library as home feel intimate even though it's 1.2 million square feet. So a series of very simple plans stacked, producing this dense section, um, allowing visitors to hopscotch between these dense floors or descend into them to consult stacks, um, offices, and smaller, you know, smaller spaces. The perimeter of the project is clad in terracotta, which actually uh, the first books in China were uh, the city of terracotta blocks. So we imagine a table next screen of unglazed terracotta, glazed on the outside, that would um, surround the building, mitigating heat gain, but also creating a shimmering, ambiguous, and constantly changing condition. So we won the competition, but unless you want to come for a long drink with us, you will never understand exactly how it's not going to get built. But when we lose a competition or it, things like that happen, we build a model. 
So this is a model we built in the office as a sort of consolation just so we could have it at least built to some extent. <laughs> so after 20 years of practice, um, working mostly in the public realm, we, we somehow never got a house commission and the Otis house collapsed until our son connected us with his friend whose family <laughs> needed a house. So he got a commission or a <laughs> he got an iPhone actually. <laughs> he was 12. Um, so this house, which we, um, we call House Between Forest and Field, also came out of his little brother's uh, suggestion that we should make it a tree house, which we willfully misinterpreted to think about a house that kind of operates basically like trees with as few walls as possible. But we we're also very interested in the iconic pot house or barn shape because of the context, which is in a beautiful place in Dutchess County, upstate New York, um, and literally between forest and field. So instead of walls, we tried to imagine cores, a chimney, a library, a kitchen, a stair, that um, through the various uh, sort of positions and sizes would create a, a space that is not fully complete or closed, but that flows one from the other. So the upper level is where the family will, will live, um, living between these cores, while we convince them to place their bedrooms at grade on the sloping side so they can actually open their um, terrace doors and walk right out into the field. These cores ver have variable connections to uh, the perimeter, sometimes touching them, sometimes not, with skylights that uh, uh, sort of uh, play up uh, this engagement. And one uh, area of the house uh, we really left empty, which you'll see on the left, <coughs> which is um, covered screen porches, which you see beyond. So the house is comprised of these wood-clad cores and a very simple drywall because we couldn't afford uh, to do uh, anything else in this case <laughs> on the perimeter. So this porch here is a room, but it's um, supported by delicate three inch square uh, solid uh, rods and uh, supports a continuation pattern. A space that hopefully will uh, evolve as the family understands how to appropriate it. So I would say incomplete contributes to objective aspects of our work. Ambiguity is about the subjective. Uh, the book is organized around two uh, long essays called Incomplete and Ambiguity, and the drawings are the central story. If you've been to the Storm King Art Center uh, outside of New York City, you might have walked by this fence, this piece by Alison and Cho, it's called Mirror Fence, or you may have disappeared, um, you may have missed it because it tends to disappear. In form, it's an op doppelganger of a picket fence, but this fence, rather than dividing space, dissolves into a landscape of light, weather, and season. They are obsessed with similar ideas. How can we register the impermanent concepts and conditions of our projects? How can the perception of a building be folded into its surroundings, collapsing far and near, or objects appear? We are, of course, drawing on a long history about ambiguity, um, from Empson to Venturi to Rowe, our focus is partly on conveying material and temporal ambiguity. How can we remix concepts and destabilize the perception of our work? And so for us, the almost building is intentionally vulnerable to conflicting interpretations and resists a stable identity. If you have been to Chicago, you may have visited this site, maybe here. If you are a Chicagoan, you probably go once and never again because it was a tourist trap. And so similar to other American waterfronts, you can understand that there's been two phases of redevelopment. The first turned urban industrial edges into these carnivalesque type marketplaces um, on at the city's margins. And the second, which I consider the ongoing um, re-renovation, is turning those com overtly commercial edges back into more passive um, uh, and, and more publicly accessible public spaces. And so this is maybe here. Burnham's plan actually included five of these. Only one of them was ever built. It's been everything from a, a military depot to um, the site where they manufactured arms uh, during World War I to a uh, university, DePaul University, um, to what was called the People's Pier, and this was the pier that we inherited. So completely chock full of funnel cake, which Chicagoans love, and vendors, and all, all of that, that you couldn't actually see the lake. 
And so a lot of our work was to completely declutter, start with erasing and um, creating these pockets along the pier to reconnect Chicagoans back to Lake Michigan and back to the city. And so all of the structures that we did, um, and this was uh, in collaboration with Kings County Field Operations, all of the structures somehow re-engage, reframe, and reflect the city and the lake. Starting with what we call the lake pavilions. There are a series of these along the pier. The pier is 3,000 feet long. It's a bit of an endurance test to get from one edge to the other. We started with simple, dumb idea of what if we just you know, took a slice out of the lake, floated it above our heads, and in that way, re-stitching, re remixing um, the near distance of the public promenade with the far distance of the lake and the skyline into one plane, and one that changes all the time. Because in the summer, the lake is literally this Caribbean blue, and of course, it almost freezes, particularly along the coastline. Um, and is very, very gray, like the sky in Chicago um, in, in the winter. What we didn't understand uh, about Chicago, um, so here's some images to um, get a sense of that kind of remixed promenade and the mountain side view. What we didn't understand is um, in Chicago, in the summer time, the lake is infested with flies and spiders, um, and they love our lake pavilion because it's illuminated at night and it's just a treat. It's a feast for the spiders. And so in the summer, the lake pavilions are covered with spider waste. Um, but we are open to appropriation, so we have to include the spiders in there also, I think. Um, marking the beginning of the pier used to be this kind of red, you know, tubular frame um, gateway, which did everything to further marginalize the pier, the sense of the pier as a kind of edge, um, a, an other space from the city. Um, and so we demolished that and um, basically instead of reinforcing that boundary, wanted to confuse that boundary even more. And so we designed this info tower um, if you stand in a certain direction or distance from it, it mimics the skyline, but actually it's only 45 feet tall. Um, but this is a way in which we are always trying to bring a larger and further context um, and uh, um, into our work and also to play with scale and perception. The info tower is clad with glass that has um, a frit um, that is a mirror frit. And there's more and more of it as you get higher up. And so as you look up, it tends to disappear or reflect the fireworks or whatever um, the, festiv the festivity is on the pier. Um, the light is programmed um, to also reflect the, um, uh, the moon cycle. Um, so in a new moon, the light is low and kind of amber color. And um, with the full moon, it becomes brighter and brighter, um, which is another way of trying to ground the project into the culture and the climate of where we live. Is the Ponte Vecchio a street or a continuous building? It was built as a bridge for the Medici's to cross from one side to the other without mixing with the public. Um, slowly to finance it, shops appeared, more and more shops appeared. Um, and so we can say that it evolved into this typologically ambiguous hybrid with both ends, both street and building. We love to think about these conditions. If something occupies a gradient from one between one thing and another, it's almost simultaneous, therefore also something else, in this case, an almost building. To paraphrase Rosalind Krauss, we imagine architecture as a series of conditions between building and not building. Somewhere in between is usually where we have the most fun. <laughs> what fascinates us with this indeterminacy is the variety of interpretations and therefore experiences that could emerge. The simplest idea, um, example of this is building a sign. This is our um, 
facility building for the Department of Transportation. Um, this is the site um, of the asphalt plant and also where all of the vehicles go to be maintained. It's at a, it's an extremely bleak, gray, full of asphalt uh, environment. This is a diesel pumping station. Our work um, encompassed a lot of environmental remediation, et cetera, including changing the flow of the site. So this building literally plays with um, VOT signage and points to where you should go. The other building is an electronic, this is, yeah, electric transformers building that steps up power. Sorry, this is the first one. This little squiggle is the electrical engineer's um, signal or, or diagram for stepping power up, which is exactly what the building does. It wears its functions on its sleeve and provides a little bit of humor in a very bleak environment. Um, another play of technological uh, ambiguity is this project um, in Kowloon, Taiwan. It's a very beautiful eco, uh, ecological um, uh, coast of Taiwan. We were invited as artists um, to uh, draw attention to a potential um, development of a casino in the place of a new forest, a young forest. Um, and so we decided through our research that um, we wanted to build a structure for the Aboriginal tribe, the, um, the Amis, who live in this area. And so we designed what we call a polycentric pavilion, um, 11 curved vaults brace each other, resting on a platform. Um, the, um, it's, it's funny because um, the, the project became divided into the naysayers and, and the, the ones that um, wanted to collaborate with us. The um, Taipei contractors thought that this project was possible. Um, and so we asked them to just prepare the deck and the foundations. The local Amis were very game, and so they did their um, bamboo canopy. Um, and so this was seven years after our um, a PS1 installation. Um, and we were very excited by um, um, testing this as a building technique, but also um, in a very different cultural context. So for the Amis, storytelling and music and dance are extremely important, um, not in a very formal way. It's extremely social and it's very reflexive. So the so-called performer might be performing a song and somebody from the audience might heckle them and it goes around and around in a very kind of informal and spontaneous way. And so between the vaults, between the, um, the, the void in the middle and, and the deck, the role of performer spectator is constantly flipping back and, uh, back and forth. Back on Navy Pier, this is the largest structure that we did called the Wave Wall. We were responding to um, the simple ask in the booth, which was to provide uh, a handicap accessible connection from the lower dock to the upper dock. Instead of ramps, we proposed elevators and this very large stair, very social stair, um, because we argued that the pier at 3,000 feet long really needs a stopping point, a destination, um, and a very informal one. It was a very long battle uh, that we had with the client who um, didn't want it at all, just wanted you know 500 feet long of storefront blazing to reveal the um, food and beverage underneath. Um, it is um, built, um, it, 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 it was built in a modular fashion, although the geometry and everything about it um, was um, singular and um, smooth and, and consistent. But um, these are the kind of uh, cassettes that were built in this steel uh, shop in Milwaukee and, and then combed into place. The contractor called it the swift wash of stairs which we took as a compliment. Um, but um, wave wall literally starts as a wall. 
to pass out to provide shading and then pass back in to create that 120 foot wide square that has become a much loved destination um, facing back to a lake, facing back to the water um, with um, a, a kind of spontaneous um, event space in front of it. Um, and this is where the weekly fireworks and a lot of other events So if uh, in the last set of projects, actually the last project, then we're going to show a sneak peek of uh, some three slides of a current project that for which we signed an NDA and we're not supposed to show you. <laughs> no photographs. Um, but we're asking uh, the question about the almost building of a scalable city. So Soria y Mata, linear city of 1882, imagined a continuous city of 500 me meters wide that would blur the distinctions between industry, agriculture, and life by however long, of course, as humanity requires. Um, many years later, in 1910, Ezra Campbell S. Others were back, surely unaware of Sodi Mata, proposed, um, uh, what was it called again? Oh, Road Town, Road Town. And it's a wonderful manifesto, you're gonna read very short, in which he imagines a building that is comprised of pipes and wires, and that would really connect and disperse uh, industry uh, connected to the uh, landscape. So these two projects, the influence of Soviet deservedness, the Japanese metabolists, uh, and eventually the Kobuzi de Algiers, and so on. But we're uh, inspired by these, but we also are kind of wary of the idea of a linear building as infrastructure that creates a very legible strip and therefore divides uh, buildings from context. We're interested in a sort of more messy engagement, uh, less tabula rasa, or to quote Brazilian urbanist Daniel Lerner, more like ac urban architecture. So in 2006, we had the opportunity to um, engage with uh, New York City's zoning code and the history of uh, housing types or evolution of new housing types in the city. So when Mimi and I moved to New York, we lived in a very small uh, 375 square foot apartment with <laughs> four rooms, can you imagine? I won't even go into detail about how wide the kitchen was. But so we knew uh, what it was like to live in a small apartment. And we had, to, to be honest, some misgivings about entering this competition when the developer Nanada uh, invited us to join them. But actually, we thought architects should really engage with this issue uh, because we need to respond to changing demographics and create as humane as possible uh, spaces that really make sense. So we said, sure. And then we won, so we had to do it. So Carmel Place is, um, was finished in 2016, and it's on 27th Street, just west of First Avenue, if you ever go to uh, Manhattan. And it's the first uh, microunit building in New York City. Um, I'm not sure if it'll be the last, but it's still the only one because zoning laws have not yet changed to allow for them. And in fact, we benefited from some mayoral overrides. But that's a story that you'll know from now. In, at the turn of the 20th century, Danish photographer Jacob Rees exposed the plight of the urban poor, um, galvanizing city officials to enact legislation that would improve access to light and air. On the right, you see a slightly outdated um, graphic which shows that the average housing uh, area, area of a single home or an apartment in the United States has been increasing, right? It was 1,000 square feet around the time of the sec uh, Second World War. It peaked at about 2,700 square feet. The data's a bit old, but it goes up and down now with uh, the price of oil, the economy, things like that. But this upward trending graph is actually antithetical to what's really happening inside. Um, at the time of our competition, only about 18% of New Yorkers um, uh, were not, uh, comprised of nuclear families, so 82% non-nuclear, and a very high percentage of single-person uh, households which is of course a trend nationwide, but also uh, global. And we'll start to see this more and more in uh, BRICS countries like Brazil, uh, India, and China, of course, as you know, demographics change, uh, more access to education for women, divorce uh, increasing, marriage delaying, um, education, medical, uh, you know, and so on. All these factors are contributing to longevity, but also contributing to us being alone, it turns out. So we're interested in rethinking the idea of an apartment or a house or a, a multifamily house, not as a unit, but as a kind of dispersed home, um, something that would adapt um, not just to social change, but the ways in which we live and work. 
So the competition we uh, responded to, which is that it had to be developer-led, it had to be a really serious competition, not just a design, but really a promise to build it with all the financing and everything, um, was preceded by a research uh, phase um, and a kind of a set of uh, conferences and so on, um, um, led by the Citizens Housing Planning Council, as well as uh, the city, uh, um, the mayor's office, and Housing Preservation and Development Agency in New York. And this was at the Center for Architecture, and this is before we even designed anything. This was something that, you know, uh, an exhibition about this topic. So we benefited from a lot of uh, research and interest in the topic. So we won the competition in 2013. Uh, I, we like to say because of this image a little bit, where we um, made it look like it was already there, it was already happening. Um, so many people looked at us saying, wow, it's already under construction. But we curated this rendering to make it look like that and to explain the modular construction technique that we proposed. And so here it is three years after that. So the project is comprised of 55 um, studio units, um, ranging from 260 to 360 square feet with a median of 300 square feet. They're all rental, um, like any apartment, uh, one year lease and so on. 40% um, of them had to be affordable, 50% market rate. And the ratio of affordability and market rate is one of those things that's subject to political discussions and is always changing as, we're, as our client in the city was trying to convince community boards and council members and so on. So since the modules or the units are so small, it's so important that the public spaces or shared spaces should be large at, or, and, and well-placed. So the lobby we designed as an urban suite to connect the door uh, to a, a small garden. And our fantasy, which never happened, but it still could, is that everyone could have dinner together in this, in this um, uh, lobby. In our minds, if you make the corridor wide enough, it becomes almost a room, and therefore uh, un unanticipated, and we, we don't know what's gonna happen in it, and it's, it's just a little bit of a strange proportion, so it, it sponsors appropriation. And things have happened there. This is where we held the ribbon cutting ceremony. It became a theater with a uh, deputy mayor on the right there, and a formerly homeless veteran who now lives in the building speaking and so on. So it's really interesting to see that. We have a gym on the bottom left, a cafe on the bottom right. So now while the um, 55 units are all uh, studios, there's actually a kind of a spectrum of variation within that type. Um, some smaller, some slightly larger, which actually really helps to have slightly different price points, but also kind of differences like the one on the bottom right that has a little kind of um, breakfast area. As I mentioned, we use modular construction. Here you see the actual modules and what we call the mate lines in plan as in terms of how these modules come together. And one thing we reveal in, in, in the book, a few copies of which we have up front um, after, after this in a minute, uh, is how this is built. How do you weave systemic uh, things like mm, toilet and uh, kitchen exhaust and you know, uh, plumbing and so on through something that's essentially Lego. And so there's um, a real contradiction between the idea of modular construction and the systems that then uh, support it. So this shows you sort of the mate lines. So we are really interested in uh, the way this, this, this project would not celebrate the individual, the individual unit, but in fact integrate itself within the city. But a bit about the modular construction. We had two sides to visit, which is really confusing for us, but also really confusing for the electrician and other, uh, <laughs> other subcontractors who ask, wait, I have to come back? I've, I've just wired up these units. So there's a huge in inertia in the construction industry uh, that really kind of precludes modular construction at some level. So this little short film is a day in the life of a factory. It's basically like a Model T Ford. You see on the right, a steel chassis comprised of hollow steel sections, four by four, four by six, and four by eight. That's it, the entire building is supported on those and a three inch concrete slab. And then it's connected uh, all together with lightweight steel. And then there's stacks. And this video shows, um, well, it wasn't this fast, but it was three and a half feet, very fast. <laughs> and w what one of the things the city really liked about this was that it really, um, diminishes the sort of an impact on the neighborhood, less, less sound, and you, know, you might not <laughs> go by it for a couple of weeks and you, you, you arrive three weeks later and there it is, right? But of course, modular construction takes longer because of all the other things. So across the spectrum, a variety of units, we tried to do everything we could to make them feel spacious. And this may sound like a real estate broker, but we started to say, they're bigger in every way except for area. They have more storage. Um, you know, nine foot eight ceiling heights, eight foot tall sliding doors, uh, Juliet balconies, uh, which is just a piece of glass, right? And so on, a full kitchen. Um, and so we had an aversion to balconies for many reasons. One is nobody uses them above like three stories maybe. 
And the other is that it blocks your connection to the sky and to the ground. And we really thought it's very important when living in small units that you should be able to feel the outside um, and have a good roof, a roof deck. So the first person to sleep in the unit was the New York Times editor. Um, she blogged about how she lived there. She invited her editor friends, but she didn't cook. She ordered Chinese takeout, and that's our only regret, but it was really fun to see um, the, the, the food. Pizza? No, it was Chinese. Pizza? I've been saying it wrong for all these lectures. <laughs> so while, while the project is only uh, like a nine or 10 story, depending on how you count, building, uh, it's, and it's surrounded by a much taller context, it had an outsized um, uh, impact on the housing in New York City. Um, the year that, or the year, at the end of the year when it was completed, the Zoning for Quality and Affordability Act was, was, um, was passed, which allows for micro units, but uh, not all micro units. Because of the density law, for which is one of the two mayoral overrides we received, you can't basically pack a building with micro units. I like to describe it as like a balloon. If you compress one side, the other side gets bigger. So you can create a smaller unit, but then you have to have a couple of big units, right? So that law uh, um, was, was overridden for us, as was the minimum unit size, which prior to this uh, new act in 2015 was 400 square feet. This is a view of the roof deck, uh, most of which is public on the left there. Is a salon. Again, we really um, were lucky to have won a competition because I think working with a developer, it might have been more difficult to retain some of these ideas um, and really deliver something uh, good. So the developer had to basically um, do what we designed in the competition. So that, that's a good thing. Now, the building itself is a, we thought of as a microcosm of the city skyline, and we really were interested in the space between buildings. So on your right, which is to the south, is an institutional building uh, built with white brick, and on the left is the NYSA housing in dark gray brick. So we imagined the building as a kind of a gradient, literally, and so we chose four uh, tones of gray brick uh, from white to dark gray and designed the building as a series of what we call micro towers, slender 11 foot wide volume that create different ambiguous um, readings as you move around the site. So can we think of units a living beyond the four walls, a dispersed home that parallels the increasing complexity of our lives? Could we think of a building as a microcosm of the city skyline? Can we think of housing as infrastructure? And where does one building begin and another end? Are there intermediate conditions? Now, these are some of the questions that we're asking in a new project that is 10 times the size in Miami. We're ending the schematic design phase next week. Um, 680 units, basically, come together around a courtyard, which we're calling a canyon. And this is the heart of the building where um, communal kitchens, dining rooms, a library, gaming rooms, laundry and games, uh, working spaces, decks, and so on and so forth, gyms, wellness, spa, restaurants, um, basically collect this space in a, in a hopefully new type, which is actually an, a kind of an uh, emerging uh, issue across the, the world, this idea of co-living. You've probably um, encountered it in, in some places, so it's not kind of unique to this project, of course, but it is something interesting. We think it's one of the next kind of um, you know, transformations of housing. So in a photo in our living room, seven giant bees have invaded the Italian Lake Garden. This is the whimsical work of uh, artist and friend Nina Kachigurian as part of her sea reclining series. She basically does these things uh, on airplane flights with things at hand, in this case, a piece from her hat and the in-flight magazine. So it's become our daily inspiration as we uh, search for an architecture that's simultaneously occupying different realms. It's also a metaphor for our, our practice, the airplane cabin, standing in for our intellectual workspace, a space full of constraints and opportunities. So in, in our book, um, we put forward an architecture that embra embraces impermanence of things as well as their perception. So while notions of the incomplete refer to the physical realm and the physical limits of architecture, we're equally interested in the ambiguity that invites questions about the perceived or subjective limits. So for us, the almost building is an act of resistance, um, resistance to closure and a constant reminder to invite others. Thank you so much.